I'm Sam and this is Baby Ready. And today we're going to talk a little bit about coping strategies using pharmacologic pain management techniques, including things like epidural, nitrous oxide, and morphine. I want to talk about epidurals last because that's the thing that everyone runs to, but it is important to know that there are some other options available to you. If you're very early in the labor process, things are getting just slowly started and perhaps it's being started artificially using synthetic oxytocin and contractions are still spaced far apart and you just feel like you're not coping well. I see this happening often with parents I've worked with who have had their labor stop and start several times without truly getting going. And so to go into the process, to have the labor started artificially using synthetic oxytocin, which is a continuous feed of medication, therefore continuously providing contractions or what feels like contractions, whether they're working particularly well on the cervix or not, can be exhausting. And so to start the whole process from a deficit of fatigue is a challenging place to be, but it's not unfamiliar or uncommon. Morphine is typically the uh, narcotic that's used most frequently in the greater Toronto area that I'm familiar with. I used to see Demerol being used more frequently, but truly in the last 15 years or so, it's been more of a switch to morphine, and that is a small dose of morphine administered to the laboring parent early, early in the process with the expectation that it will have an opportunity to provide some relief and some relaxation so that the parent can actually get some rest early in the process. It lasts for about three hours, um, but it can have a bit of an allergic type effect on many people. So it's not uncommon to see that administered with Benadryl or something similar as a, as a way to try and combat the, the hives and sometimes the nausea that can come at, with a narcotic being administered. So um, that's something to take into consideration. As I say, it's generally only used very, very early in the process. But if it's something that you need, if you truly need some real help, I have had parents who've had a morphine shot earlier in the process. They've had a chance to rest and relax. Their bodies had a chance to catch up and start working with the medication in their system. And the labor's been moving forward so that by the time the morphine has worn off, they haven't really required any other pain medication to cope with the balance of labor before the birth. It isn't a medication that's administered frequently, but it is one that is used in labor. So don't hesitate to ask if it is something that you truly need and talk to your care provider about it and see what their thoughts are. But that's not one that's discussed a lot, primarily because it's administered directly into the blood system. So it rapidly gets to the placenta. And so there is a concern about baby being born during the window of time where that blood that is still affected by the morphine is in baby system, circulating through baby system, not pumping back out and being flushed back out to the placenta again to be evacuated through the birthing parent's body um, as waste. And if baby is born with that dose of medication in their system, it can be something that is traumatic for the baby and it can be difficult for the baby in terms of respiratory rate and oxygen saturation levels and things like that. So they use very careful guidelines before they administer it. It isn't without risk, but it is something that can sometimes help. Nitrous oxide is another tool that I see being used quite frequently in the latter part of labor, depending on where you're birthing. Some facilities don't have nitrous oxide or what many call laughing gas um, as an option to them. So it would really be a conversation you'd want to have with your care provider as to whether or not it's something you can think about putting in your toolbox as an opportunity to use later on, should you decide that you need a little bit of help in the labor process, but you're not looking for an epidural. During the labor process, nitrous oxide is used truly as a last means to get the birthing parent through the latter part of transition and ready for pushing. It is not something that's used on an ongoing basis and truly cumulatively, they do not want to see you use it for an extended period of time. It does have a couple of challenges that can present with it. 
one of which can be that it can be dehydrating because it's a compressed gas. So you will need to make sure that you're continuing to chew ice chips or take drinks of water on a regular basis between contractions. It is something that's utilized only during a contraction. So as a contraction approaches, you'll be given a long tube with a mouthpiece in it. You put that into your mouth, wrap your lips around it and breathe deeply in and then exhale back out through the same tube and in through the mouth and out through the mouth to get that medication into your system. And what we'll do is it can it make your contractions feel shorter. They're not physically shorter, but the intensity of the contractions can diminish and it can make the contractions feel a little bit shorter. They ask that between contractions, you completely remove the tube from your mouth. You simply breathe clean air. And it is a fast acting technique or tool, but it doesn't last a particularly long time in your system. So they do want to make sure that you, you use it only in the latter part of labor. It is cumulative in your system as all medications can be if we're getting them for a prolonged period of time. So they want to use it only when you truly, truly need it. And it is a great tool as I see parents getting just towards eight, nine, 10 centimeters. They're just about ready to start pushing. Contractions are coming frequently and they're feeling overwhelmed by them. They just need something to kind of help get them over that edge so that they can actively start to participate in the birth process. And that nitrous oxide gift can be truly that, a gift to, that you can give yourself without, as I say, needing to go the route of asking for an epidural. And truthfully, if your labor is happening fairly quickly, by the time you get to that point that you're asking for help, it may be a time by, that by asking for an epidural, it isn't that it's too late to get an epidural. As I've said before, that too late window is really just a set of numbers and, and, and things that are passed around from person to person, but it can be too late in that if you ask for an epidural, by the time they, uh, you're prepped for, this, for the procedure and then the anesthetist comes in to administer the procedure, by the time the epidural medication's in your system and may be able to start taking effect, you're already in the pushing process and don't need to necessarily be medicated. So nitrous oxide can be that transitional tool. And then we get to epidurals. And we've all heard all kinds of people talk about epidurals. Quite honestly, I often hear partners of birthing parents being told by their peers at work or their friends that have babies already that they should do themselves a favor and make sure that their partner has an epidural because birthing parents all need to have epidurals apparently. I've had some clients tell me that they plan to walk in backwards to the hospital so that the anesthetist can meet them at the elevator and they can get that epidural before they even feel a contraction start. It doesn't happen quite like that. And I know you know that. It is a very difficult conversation to have because anyone who is hoping to have an unmedicated birth or planning to have an unmedicated birth goes through the process of feeling as though they need to defend their thoughts and their actions and their choices to other people. It's not uncommon and I've actually been in hospital before when I've walked into triage with a client and when the triage assessor talked to that person, they asked when they planned to have an epidural and that birthing parent said, but they didn't plan to have one only to be told with a laughing voice, yeah, let me know how that works out for you. It's hard to feel confident in the decisions that you make. And it is never the wrong decision to choose to have an epidural if that's the right choice for you. It is important to know that there are pros and cons. Some people are really challenged by the idea that they won't be able to get up and move about for themselves. And that includes getting up to avoid their bladder. So you will have to have a catheter either placed inside and left inside in your, in your bladder or that they will have to drain your bladder on a regular basis throughout the process of the labor once medication's in place. It can drop your blood pressure and it can drop it enough that they need to give you boluses of clear fluids to keep your body well hydrated to bring that back up. If you have dangerously low blood pressure already, it is a consideration to take into account and it may be something that you want to bring up with the care provider looking after you at that time. Just remind them. It's not that it's not in your chart, but it is something that you may want to choose to remind them 
some people will hear about others describing long-term back pain as a result of having had an epidural. In my experience, it's not the epidural that creates the long-term back pain, but rather if you get an epidural earlier in the labor process versus later in the labor process, you may have that medication in your system for a prolonged period of time. And the longer it's in your system, it is cumulative, the more frozen you may find that you become. It really truly depends on the individual. But what does often happen when we're in hospital beds is you'll see that the bed has a flat part on it and the top comes up and, and it'll be just slightly elevated. But if you're laying on your side on this bend and then on the other side, because we keep rotating you back and forth when you have an epidural to make sure that you are um, adequately frozen on both sides because it's gravity based. With gravity, it's not uncommon to see the birthing parents sliding down the bed. And so what I can sometimes see is someone bending less in their hip joints where they're meant to bend and more in the middle of their back. And if you maintain that position for a prolonged period of time and are moved about in a way that you can't truly feel because you're frozen, then you can cause trauma to your back that may take time to recover from. So do enlist the help of your partner. If they notice that you're starting to slide down the bed, ask them to help by you planting your feet and then hooking their arms underneath your shoulders to drag you back up the bed so that you're bent where you're supposed to be bent. The long-term back pain is more often associated with something like that and less than it being something to do with the needle that went in. It's medication going into your body to relax muscles and it can have an effect of slowing your labor down. That's not unusual. And so to that end, I encourage you to be aware of that and keep that in mind that you want to make sure that your labor is very well established before you ask for an epidural to decrease the likelihood that you'll have to have your labor augmented by other medications like synthetic oxytocin. When I was teaching classes and attending births at a local hospital, the handout that expectant parents were provided and asked to read before an epidural was administered advised that the number one most common potential side effect or complication that could come up as a result of an epidural was that of a spinal headache. And the headache is almost like a migraine type of an intensity. It typically only lasts for a few days, but I will be honest and say that if you are the one that has had this happen, then that headache for three or four days when you have a brand new baby is overwhelmingly uncomfortable and difficult to manage. The statistic that they provide was that it happens in one or two out of every hundred epidurals that are administered. I'll be honest, spinal headaches are not the most common potential complication or side effect that I've personally seen when my clients have had epidurals. The complication that I see coming up most frequently is that of the medication not providing the kind of relief that the patient was expecting that they're frozen completely on one side and not so well on the other, no matter how many times we flip them back and forth. Or they're frozen really well everywhere, except perhaps this rectangle on their back or on their hip or down front. Everyone is affected very differently. You may be so frozen you can't wiggle your toes. And I have truly had more than one person be unable to feel any benefit from the epidural at all because their body just didn't manifest a good response to it. So they had to be treated as though they were medicated, but they felt completely unmedicated. And I've seen a variety of different things in between. And the challenge is each individual is unique and each epidural is unique. And so every single time an epidural is administered, whether it's one person who's had seven of them over the years, or it's seven people who have each had one, every experience is going to be different. And it's difficult to wrap your head around that when you're in the process of labor. I will never, ever, ever tell someone that they should not have an epidural because this is truly your opportunity to make decisions about your experience. And no one has the right to tell you how you should feel or what decisions you should make. But I do want to make sure that you have some information so that you can feel like you're making an informed decision and give yourself permission to change your mind from time to time. It's okay to not have all the answers at the time that you're in labor. 
in spite of feeling as though you had all the answers while you were still pregnant. You'll change your mind a thousand times through the process and that's okay. It may be beneficial to have a bit of a code word with your partner. When I'm working with a couple who've told me explicitly that they would really rather have an unmedicated delivery than one with an epidural, then I typically work out with them that I will wait to get the cue from them. The cue that I usually use with a birthing parent is waiting for them to ask me for an epidural. I will never offer one or recommend one if they would rather not have one. If they ask me to find their care provider so that they can ask for an epidural, then I'll ask them if they can do three more contractions. If they feel that they can't do three more contractions, then I know that they've truly hit their wall. But if they say to me that they feel confident they can do their contractions three more times, then I know that that means that I need to work harder and differently to help redirect how they're thinking, how they're feeling and how they're coping because what I'm doing is no longer as effective as it should be. And that's okay because things change throughout the labor process. Things become more intense. Some things work for a while like cold cloths, bathtubs and rocking chairs. And later on, sometimes really things need to be more sedentary, low voices, soft music, dim lights, and gentle sways may be more effective. So sometimes I need to rethink how I'm working with a family to help bring their baby forward. But they all know beforehand that that's the kind of code that I use. So do maybe think about one with your partner if you're hoping to have an unmedicated birth so that you can come up with strategies to try to help you meet your goal, whatever it is. And epidurals can offer pain relief. And so they shouldn't be dismissed. For some people, they're exactly the pain relief they need to get the rest that they need, to have the energy that they need to push their baby out. And for other people, on very rare instances, I've actually seen an epidural speed up the process. That so much tension has been being held in their body through the labor process, through anxiety or fear or whatever it was, that by the time they got the epidural, the epidural was exactly what they needed to relax their body, allow the baby to th move through the muscles and be on the outside. So there are no perfect answers. It is important to know that until the epidural is in place, it is always your right and privilege to decide you do or do not want to have one. This is your process, this is your journey, and you have every right to do what works for you. I'm always on your side. And if you have any questions, concerns, if you ever hear a story that you're not sure is true and you just want clarification, reach out. Send me an email at babyreadylgbtq at gmail.com. Leave a comment on the submission page at www.babyready.info or leave a comment here on the YouTube channel. I'll get back to you. I'll help you find the answers that you're looking for so that you can have the birth you're striving to have. I'm not sure what we're talking about next time. There's been a few comments made to me about topics that people would like me to cover. I would like to spend some time talking about life with a new baby and I'll probably get into that a little bit more. I'm recording this weekend some videos with uh, an expectant parent and her sister. And we're gonna pose some of those clips about coping strategies, non-pharmacologic coping strategies you can use for your labor process. That'll accompany this video so that they're both posted simultaneously and you have the opportunity to create a plethora of decisions for yourself as to what you think may or may not work for you. I will post again soon. I look forward to hearing from you, and I'm truly honored that you chose to be on this journey with me. Have a great day.